Now, last month, was, was, we, we had the fantastic news, of course, that the um, video game tax credit had um, finally been approved by Europe. Um, and as an industry, a great debt of gratitude to, to Jo and her team uh, at UK, um, to, 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 to the guys at Tiger, and, and, and the politicians that supported us. So this next session is to talk about how to claim your tax break. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, and thank you for uh, giving us the space at Game Horizon. This panel session, we've been taking around the country on a UK-wide tour, uh, comeback tour maybe. And um, usually we do this uh, panel session in about two hours. <laughs> So we've managed to secure 35 minutes, so I'll shut up now. And I'm very pleased to have this panel of experts, and really this is a chance for you to ask questions. As, as Charles said, the um, battle to get the tax breaks uh, has been long, hard fought by many people, many voices, and it's finally come through. Um, we heard in an earlier session how technology is such an important part of uh, value in companies. So we already have the R&D tax credit. So this tax credit is based on cultural grounds to incentivize the production of culturally relevant uh, British or European uh, games and Newcastle is a great example you have Realm uh, which is set in Newcastle what better example so um, Anna is going to Anna is uh, heads up the BFI's uh, British Film Institute's uh, certification unit and they're the ones who take you through the cultural test which is the thing that you have to pass in order to get your tax credit um, so Anna's just going to very very briefly go through some top lines of the cultural test and some need to knows um, and then Moses is an accountant uh, and he's very used to dealing with film tax credits and he's extremely knowledgeable in this field. And there's, the tax credit's going to open up lots and lots of opportunities. So we'll hear a little bit uh, from him. Uh, and then I have Graham from HMRC, who is the man with the purse string. Um, and he's the one you have to really kind of uh, ask the t difficult questions to. And we also have Alan uh, from Harbottom and Lewis, who's just going to touch on, um, when we open up for questions, some of the legalities and some of the legal considerations that you have to take into account. So, Anna, take it away. Thank you. So I'm going to run through this very, very briefly. I've only got one slide that I want you to look at. So basically, it's a points-based test. Um, it's 31 points is the maximum, but you only need 16 points to pass, and it's broken down into the four sections, as you can see. So cultural content is setting, characters, story, or underlying material, and language. So for setting is the game set in the UK, the European economic area, or an unidentified location. Now, it's key, the unidentified location is key, especially for video games. Only the video game sector and the animation sector have this in a cultural test. We have four cultural tests. Film doesn't have unidentified location. So for unidentified location, we're thinking of um, other planets, other fantasy worlds. Um, again, characters, up to four points are available for characters who are British citizens or residents or European econom economic area citizens or residents or citizens or residents of a unidentified planet or other land. So there's real opportunity there for games that you wouldn't think would qualify to pass. Section A3 is, is it a British story or a European story or is the underlying material by a British or European citizen or resident? So, for example, if you wanted to make a game out of Romeo and Juliet, but you set it in America, but it's obviously Romeo and Juliet, you'd get four points for underlying material because the underlying material is obviously by Shakespeare. And finally, in set and cultural content, language. You can get up to four points for language, and that includes um, uh, that's English, all the regional languages, British Sign Language, and that also includes narration and text-based dialogue. So if, you don't ha if your characters aren't speaking, you still get points if the, the instructions or text-based dialogue is in English. Cultural contribution is, you can get up to four points for British creativity, either behind um, the game, so the people that are making the game, if you're doing something that's unique, that's not been seen before. Cultural heritage, does your game reflect cultural heritage through its narrative? Is it a World War II game, for example? or diversity, and diversity isn't limited to being just British. It could be that you have um, a female lead or a lead from uh, British uh, Asian minority ethnic ethnicity. Finally, uh, so section, that's cultural contributions. Section C, cultural hubs, up to three points is awarded for where the work is actually taking place. And in section D, up to eight points. And there's eight categories, and that's for your practitioners. Now, in each category, the categories are relevant to the game sector, 
And what I would also stress is if you are, say if you're a very small games company, but you do take on two or three of the roles in the cultural practitioners cat category, you get a point for every category it applies to you. So if you're the project leader and one of the artists and you compose the music, you get a point in every category. So that's a very quick roundup. There are leaflets, which Dan has down there, that will give you a bit more detail, and I'm going to be around for two or three hours afterwards if you want to sp have a qu quick chat about your project. It is quite accessible to pass. Um, we've, on the road shows that we've done, we've been using examples like Super Hexagon and um, Thomas Was Alone, where although they wouldn't get points for A1 and A2 setting and characters, they would get points for underlying material and language, and I actually would get way more than 16 points to qualify. So that's the kind of thing, if you think about, if your game is in that sort of category where there's abstract content, it would probably pass. And I think that's really important. A couple of things that are really innovative is it is extremely inclusive, isn't it? It's very accessible. It is for games companies of all sizes, and we'll find out what that actually means in a minute. But it is meant to be inclusive, and it's not meant to be a test to put up a hurdle so that you fail. Yeah, it's, we are trying to... We want you to come to us and talk through your project rather than if you, do, if you think you, you can't qualify, that's it. Come and speak to us, and we can look at how, we can, how you will be able to qualify. And I think the diversity point is really interesting as well, and uh, something that um, we might come back to. Okay, so I know this is complicated and there's a lot of information. Um, there are guides available, uh, so um, come and get them afterwards. Let's go straight to Moses, who can just talk a little bit, and we can return back in the, in the questions, because I want to give you a chance to ask some questions, uh, back to some of the slides. Um, so Moses, how do Thanks. I qualify? Okay, great. So I'll just touch on a few key bits, um, how you qualify, um, what the value is, all importantly, and, um, and the process. Um, so there's four main criteria that you need to meet in order to qualify for the incentive, and I've listed them there. One is the, the company, you have to incorporate a company, the, 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 uh, you can only access the incentive via submitting your company tax return. So it's not an incentive that is available to individuals, it's only available to uh, games development company. So if you're a one-man band and you're working in, in your bedroom, set up a company. Um, and it's um, easy, isn't it? So easy. It costs 15 quid to, 15 to set quid, it up. 15 quid, 10 minutes Absolutely, online. Yeah. It, 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 it's, uh, but it's, 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 it's one, if you don't do it, then you're, you, know, you could be the most uh, qualifying game in, in all other aspects, but you won't get any incentive. Um, the company has to meet certain criteria in terms of being responsible for the whole development of the, of the game. Um, but set up the company and you can do the rest uh, structurally. Uh, the game has to be intended for supply to the uh, general public. And all that means is it's not designed f um, for people who are just, I guess, designing a game for their, their friends and family and, and, and um, that's about it. If, you, if you're creating a game and you're intending to supply it, it doesn't have to be necessarily profitable in, in the first instance, but it's, there's a commercial reasoning behind the development. Um, then you call it, you tick that box. Third criteria is you need to pass the cultural tests, which Anna has, has touched on. And the, the fourth criteria you need to meet is at least 20, there's a floor of spend, exp, minimum expenditure that you have to uh, spend in the EEA to qualify, which is 25%. So if you spend at least 25% of your budget in the European economic area, um, then you've, you've met that, that criteria. So those are the four. Um, in terms of uh, value, um, it's effectively 25% of whatever you spend in the uh, European economic area. If you think of your budget, there are probably a few exclusions which, which don't count towards the incentive, just things like um, initial concept work where the expenditure which is seen to be speculative and you're incurring it before you actually know you're going to develop anything. Those kind of costs don't count and any post-completion um, costs like debugging and, and maintenance costs, those don't count. That shouldn't be confused with, with further development costs, which do count. Um, that, that's an important point, just to reiterate. So we pushed very hard, and no other scheme has this, for uh, you know, recognizing that games can be a service, and as iteration, when you release it, it's not, that's not it. So you can claim on post-release production costs, Correct. but just not the server maintenance and debugging. We had a big argument to tell you yeah. about what debugging actually means. So yeah. just call it a, a patch. Yeah, I, I think new it, content. I, I suspect it would be a very, very small percentage of, of your budget, um, which won't count towards your um, 
uh, the, the, the incentive. So of your budget, uh, you get 25% of whatever you spend in the European economic area. There is a cap on, on the amount of expenditure that's available for the incentive, and that's 80% of your, of your budget. So you don't get incentivized for spending more than 80% of your budget in the European economic area. You just get the tax credit on the first 80%. So looking at that pie chart there, the, the light green bit, which is your first 80%, um, you'll get 25% tax credit on that. You don't get 20% on the remaining tax credit. Um, but having said that, you, you know, there are other credits out there like the R&D tax credit. So um, to the extent that that 20% expenditure relates to R&D expenditure, you can claim the tax credit on that and, and uh, sort of add that to the tax credit that you're claiming on the, um, on the, the remaining expenditure. You can't claim R&D expenditure and tax and, the, and get the video games tax credit on the same expenditure. You can't double dip in that respect. But so long as the, the two are claimed on different expenditure, then you're fine. Um, then finally, in terms of process, you just need three things. Um, you need to submit your um, British films, uh, your, your certificate from the BFI, which shows that you're a British game. You get that from Anna. Uh, submit that along with your uh, statutory accounts for the company and the company tax return. Submit those three documents to HMRC, and uh, within a month, you should get your money. Um, that's pretty much it. And, and the claim comes, obviously, at the end of the year. Uh, the claim can be made any time you want, really. Um, it, you, need to, you need to change your accounting year-end to suit whatever your, your cash flow requirements are. But there's no, you don't have to wait until either the ga game is completed before you can make a claim. You can make it um, any time you want. Within, if, if you need the cash within six months, you can set your accounting period. Um, you can shorten it accordingly um, and, and prepare your accounts and your tax return covering that accounting period, submit that to HMRC and, and get your money um, in the time frame that you need. There is obviously, a, um, a, there'll be transaction costs involved with making claims, which, you know, whether you're paying accountants or whatever to, to, to carry this out for you. So you have to weigh that against the cost of, of making several claims uh, throughout the life of the production. You, you can do it monthly, but it'll, you know, it'll not be cost effective. So you might want to just leave it and do it annually if you're, if you're not um, constrained for cash. And, and, two, and two points. So even if your game has started production development before 1st of April of this year, can you claim? You can. Um, so games that were, you'd still need to go through the process of getting certified uh, from Anna. And in terms of the expenditure that will be qualifying, Technically, the, the start date is the 1st of April, 2014, so it's expenditure incurred on or after 1st of April, 14, that would qualify for the incentive. Um, it's worth mentioning that there possibly would be costs that you physically were maybe invoiced and, and um, paid prior to 1st of April, but in terms of what those costs or services relate to, um, you could argue that they, they should be spread out throughout the life of the, the, the development. So you can stagger the, the if you like, amortize the, the costs and therefore um, treat some of those costs as incurred post 1st of April. It, it's, a, it's, it's a planning point, but something to, if, you, if, you, if you've got a game which is straddling the, the, the start date of 1st of April, um, don't assume that everything that you incurred 1st of April won't count to the incentive, towards the incentive. And you talked about, you know, the, the, the sort of business side of, um, you know, evaluating the costs of making a claim. So this requires quite a lot of uh, discipline in terms of running a business and Absolutely. accounting. Yes. Do you have to set up a special um, company for if you've got five games on the go? Uh, no, there is no requirement to have um, uh, a, a single company dealing with one particular game. Um, you can, if you've got an existing company and you've got five different games, that's all fine. Um, mechanically, you still have to uh, individually analyze each game as a separate trade. So when you're preparing your tax, the company tax return, each game will have to be analyzed separately. So almost similar to how you do it if you're running it through three, uh, five different companies. Um, so but it's just, just literally through... separate accounts, separate P&L, separate... Correct. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the P&L will be the same for the company, but right. the tax return will just have, if you like, yeah, five different... P&Ls to some right. extent, uh, but the, you've got the option, it's up to you. And just one more thing, um, so again, a, a, big, a key difference is there is no minimum threshold budget. In, in France, the games tax credit requires you to have a budget of 150,000 
euro or above, and I think they're trying to change that to 100,000. Whoopee! Um, but we argued that, you know, that's completely irrelevant. Uh, completely. There, there is no flaw here, and, and it's, it's worth mentioning that it, it's, it's, only, it's only available on expenditure actually incurred and, and ultimately paid. So if, you, if you've got a small budget game and, and you're one-man band and you're not really paying yourself, it's, the, the, the cost, if you like, is an opportunity cost of, of what you could have been earning elsewhere, but you're not actually paying yourself anything. At that point, you can't actually claim any tax credit because no, that company, the, the video games development company, hasn't actually physically incurred or paid any cost. However, you should still develop a discipline of recording what those costs uh, amount to, albeit they're unpaid costs. Because if you, you, you're successful and, and the game is commercially successful and you're earning revenues from it, if you channel those revenues properly and, and through the company and use it to pay yourself effectively what was a deferred fee, at that point, those costs will then become eligible for the tax credit. So as long as you've got that documented and, and there's some sort of trail, then um, you know, you'll still be in good shape. Thank you. Graham, can I just come to you? Can you just explain this EEA point? Okay, it's the... Can, uh, can you? <laughs> oh, sorry, thank you. Um, European Economic uh, Area. Uh, so the spend doesn't have to be within the UK. It mm -hmm. could be any of the countries that qualify as being part of the EEA. And that's quite generous, actually. That makes it pretty inclusive, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like a no-brainer. Surprisingly generous. Surprisingly generous. Okay, um, I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, Alan, so just, I'd like to just hear a couple of uh, implications of you know, contractually or particularly around this uh, made by video games development company because you can elect to be the uh, video game development company, can't you, even if you're not? <laughs> There's, um, is that one working? Yes. yes. So the, um, that's right. You have to elect to be the video games development company and there can only be one video games development company. The only one. <laughs> applying for the tax credit. So even if you've got, um, if you've got two um, companies that are involved in the um, development of the game, then it's the company that is most actively involved that is the VGTC. Um, also, that company is the company that is actually responsible for designing, for testing, for producing the game, and it has to be actively involved in the decision-making process. Um, it also has to be the company that is paying for the services and goods in relation to the game. Those rules were all put in place um, primarily to um, stop third-party financiers trying to claim the tax credit by saying they are the by um, by saying that they are a company eligible to claim um, in other words it's all about making sure that it's the real studio developing the game that is claiming the credit mm, okay um, just on the financing uh, point then um, we've seen in the film industry how the tax credit has managed to unlock a lot more opportunities to access finance, um, whether that be through loans or um, just cash flowing on the guarantee that you're going to get that uh, tax credit. How has that worked and do you see that happening with games companies? I think it's going to be an interesting area. Um, in terms of film and television producers, um, I mean, first of all, for people who don't know, the film tax credit has been around since 2007, and the video games credit is broadly based on the film one. Um, and then television tax credit came in uh, roughly this time last year, April last year. The, um, for most film and television producers, the tax credit is a source of finance for their films and television programs, rather than a source of revenue. Um, and that's slightly counterintuitive because, obviously, based on what Moses was saying earlier, the tax credit is inherently a source of revenue. In other words, it is paid by HMRC after spend has been incurred. It's not paid before the spend is incurred. Um, so what film and television producers have done, typically, is one of two things. They have either cash flowed the tax credit themselves, if they, if they have the resources to do that, or they have gone out to third party financiers and they've obtained a loan, as Joe was saying, against the, the future anticipated tax credit proceeds. Um, why have they done that rather than just 
claim the tax credit after um, having made the film or television programme. Well, they've done it because it's pretty hard raising money for films and television programmes. So if you have 20% or around about 20%, it's probably a bit lower than that actually, but around about 20% of your finance in place on day one, before you even start production, then it's going to be easier to go out and, r and raise the rem remainder of the finance, i.e. the 80%, rather than having to raise the full 100. Um, we're expecting, as far as the video games industry is concerned, we're expecting third-party financiers to be very willing to provide loans against the video games tax credit. Um, the reason for that is that, frankly, it's not a very risky investor, uh, investment from the financier's perspective because um, the repayment of the loan isn't dependent on the success of the game mm. at all. It's entirely dependent on the games company, the VGDC, properly complying with its obligations, basically spending the money in accordance with the budget and properly filing, making tax credit claims. Um, so it's an interesting area, as I said. I think that there will be probably some existing film and television financiers who are looking at, at um, opportunities in games, and it may also result in them looking to finance other um, areas of um, games development as well as just the tax credit. Mm -hmm. Anna? I, I was just going to say that point. We're already seeing at, at events like this that those people that do finance the film tax credit are now coming to the games event. Mm. And because they have the experience of seeing how the tax credit works for film um, and television, they know it's the same process. So I think they are sort of looking to get into the games sector as well. To they, they're usually the ones in the suits. No, can't see any. I'm not <laughs> right, I'm going to open up to the floor. Any questions? There's probably loads, I hope. Otherwise, I have some. There's one here at the front and then one there. Let's take this one here since you're closest, Sean. Um, question for the gentleman from HMRC. I mean, obviously, it's an incredibly welcome initiative. When you come to look back on it in three years' time, what will you hope to have achieved from your point of view, from the Treasury's point of view, um, uh, with this initiative? Um, I can't speak for Treasury because um, I, I work for the team that is responsible for the administration of it as opposed to the, you know, the construction of it, the creation of it, like the policy people down in London. Um, but it's obviously been introduced because there's perceived to be a market failure. So if um, we're seeing a lot of um, claims, we're seeing a lot of games, we're seeing a lot of uh, increased employment, um, all these are, are positives that, you know, the market failure um, uh, existed and hopefully has been addressed. I think that was the quite, quite interesting uh, sort of delicate political dance we had to do with EC, which was, it, this is not f f as, as an economic incentive, you know, it's against state aid rules. It has to be based on R&D or cultural grounds. So it was quite a, a kind of, obviously we know, hopefully it will mean more economic input uh, into the economy and more jobs, uh, because there'll be more studios and more development. Um, but it was kind of hard to sort of stay away from that argument. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I think you'd need to speak to um, to George, but my, my understanding is that it, 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 it's yeah, it? <laughs> uh, it, it, it's here for the, for the long term. I would think. Yeah. Uh, I mean, film's been here since '07. Uh, th there's no um, th there's there's no uh, um, any question about trying to remove that. Um, we've obviously had TV and animation introduced uh, last year. Video games, we've had EU approval now, so you know that's good to go. There's talk of uh, theatre relief coming in, so I think if anything, you're going to see more and more reliefs coming, and, and, and the ones that are in are just staying. Yeah, I would say that there's also been a tweak to the film um, tax credit recently, which is quite an important one for that industry. And so people are, if anything, the industry is looking at how to improve it um, and extend it um, rather than anything else. Uh, there's no limited pot if that. Uh, that's mm. a question I think we get asked a lot as well, because everyone thinks, oh, that when's it run out? Well, there isn't a, it's not running out. And in addition to the theatre tax relief, which I think is going to be coming in in September, um, some of the pact are already calling for a children's 
television in general tax relief. So I think they're looking to, so they've seen the model of how it works. So I think they're looking to sort of spread it as wide as they can. The kids are playing games. Uh, question here. Good running. Um, yeah, just as, as interested, is there any restriction on where the, the funding for the game comes from in the first instance? So specifically, if a game is crowdfunded, for example, does th there's no kind of restriction, there's no requirements that the money has to come from a certain place? No, it doesn't matter where your funding comes from as long as it runs through the video game development company. Is there something there about the advertising um, point? Because if, if a brand is paying you to, to commissioning the game... Yeah, so it can't be... Um, the primary purpose of the game can't be for advertising or gambling, so that's one of the um, exclusions. But you can still, you know, have brands within a game. Yeah. The, the only thing I'd add in terms of the funding is that uh, crowdfunding could sometimes be viewed as income, whereas straightforward investor funding isn't. So it's something just to be aware of, and if you speak to uh, your accountant. Mm -hmm. mm, Moses? I think my card's on your chair somewhere. <laughs> One here. Hi, I just wanted a question on the 80% um, thing. Is, is, that, is the 80% 80% uh, of the total EEA spend? So if the EEA spend is only 80% of the budget, is it scaled back? Uh, no, it's 80% of your total budget. Okay. So if, if, if you spend... If you've got I use that, that pie chart, assume that you're spending everything within the EEA. Um, but let's say your budget was 70% EEA and 30% Canada, you'd get the 25% on the 70. Thank you. And I think there's probably a point just worth making there, actually, which is that um, one of the um, practices that has become prevalent in the film and TV industry is for um, is, is for there to be co-productions between um, UK producers and let's say a Canadian or North American producer and so in Moses example there the 30 percent um, the 30 percent that isn't EEA spend could still be um, uh, could still be subject to Canadian relief for example if there was a Canadian co-producer that doesn't quite work for games in terms of co-productions but there is the ability there is the ability to subcontract to for example a Canadian um, studio that would incur that remaining, say, 20% in Canada and might be able to claim Canadian tax relief on that. So there's, there's, an, there's an angle there. Just, just to expand on that a little bit, the, with regards to the, the subcontracting part of it, um, the UK company, the company that qualifies as a video games development company, just going on the definition of what that means and, and what it has to do, it, it has to be seen to be responsible for, the, if you like, the whole development. But it, it does, it is allowed to subcontract some of the work to uh, a separate company. So if, if say, it's a subcontract, say, the testing phase to another company, um, that's fine. But there is a cap. Um, they're not allowed to subcontract any, any more than one million pounds uh, of the, the game's budget to a subcontracted um, party. Uh, if, 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 if they do, then they don't get the tax credit on any amount over the one million that's been subcontracted. Um, just maybe with a bit of history, the, the reason that is there is because unlike the other incentives in, in film, TV and animation, which is very much based on um, what you spend in the UK, the video games uh, tax credit is based on what is spent within the EEA, so not necessarily just in the UK. Um, and Whereas that was kind of something that, that we had to, to compromise with the European Commission for, for to, them to allow this incentive to, to go through. Um, but obviously, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the UK government would only really want to incentivize expenditure incurred in the UK. So the one million cap is really designed to limit the amount of work that you'd want to subcontract outside of the UK. Um, so that's what that, that is, is there for. It, it does. The, the limit isn't just uh, applied to subcontracting costs outside of the UK, but subcontracting costs outside of the, the, the one company, the, the, the video games development company. Question? Any up there? No, that's just someone fanning themselves. 
Uh, no question. Um, I've got a couple of minutes left. Um, can you just explain, Anna, so the, uh, the, the sort of cultural contribution or the creativity point, and mm -hmm. can you just talk through example of Thomas Was Alone, just to explain that one, because is it about innovation and technical innovation? It or can is be it about innovation, technical innovation. It could be about uh, the person behind it, that they are award-winning. I mean, we potentially would award a creativity point. It was BAFTA-nominated, it's been designed for several platforms. Um, we would, it, it doesn't, in the guidance notes, and this goes across all our guidance notes, we tried to keep the language around cultural contribution as wide as possible. There are a few things in there, but because it's such a subjective area, it's up to you to explain to us why this is a new creative game. What we've said before in terms of film and television, we want to see something new and different, but it could be that you're doing, you've had to create something behind the scenes that's new and different to make the game. Um, and that goes for diversity as well, in terms of it's not just the people, the characters on screen, it could be the people behind screen. Who's the project leader? Are they from a BAMA background? Are they from a, do they have a disability? Is it, you know, uh, is it a woman? So we, we try to keep it as wide as possible. And we're always open to you coming to us and explaining. Obviously, we are in a film organization, but we are employing someone from the video games world that has video games experience in the next month or so. Um, so we, you know, the process of assessing the test is obviously goes across, um, we've been doing it for nine years, but in terms of ha someone having that knowledge and, and experience of games design and, ga and the sector is important to us as well. I make this joke every time that that person's going to be the most hated or the most loved person in the industry, and we will need to provide protection, I think, for them, because they will be doing the sign-off, ultimately. Um, and just, just a last point, unless there are any other final questions, uh, just a last point. Um, uh, you, you said at the beginning it's quite an open, sort of conversational process. Yes. So in, in terms of if I make a claim now, because uh, there's today or yesterday uh, in Parliament, the legislation, uh, the finance legislation was uh, debated and it's gone through all swimmingly. But what are the next stages and what so, do you give people if they make a claim now? So at the moment, the legislation is still going through Parliament. They've done the debates. They will need to achieve royal assent and then they lay the cultural test because the cultural test is it's boring, but it's secondary legislation. So it then has to be laid after the Finance Act. So we should be able to actually issue certificates from August, which is exactly the same as happened for the animation high and television sector last year. But the claim is dated back to the 1st of April, so it's for expenditure incurred from the 1st of April. However, we are, we've been open for business in terms of taking cultural test applications since the 1st of April. We can only give you a letter of comfort, but we can go through your application now. You can apply now, and then come April, uh, come August, we're happy to exchange that letter of comfort for a and the actual interim certificate, so you can then start claiming. And you can keep checking. You can go. You don't yeah. need to just go once, and then if you push back, you don't you don't uh, qualify. You can come back again, right? If you're if you, I mean, uh, if someone's not qualifying, we'd be looking at saying, well, where is it that you're falling down and what we, can we suggest so that, you know, there are films in the last sort of seven or eight years that have changed certain elements of their production because they need to qualify for the points. Um, and we can sort of suggest things to you. We can look at the cultural contribution section, maybe something you hadn't thought of. Um, but we're open to helping you. It's not, you know, we're not there to try and catch you out and it's not one strike and you're out. And even if you had a project that you didn't qualify this time, doesn't mean that you come back again a second time. Okay, thank you. Can I just add? Yeah, yep, yeah, sure. From HMRC's perspective, I'd, I'd just say it's exactly the same. Um, we would rather that you got in touch with us early, asked us questions, sent us emails, so that we can help you through the process, um, rather that than not talk to us and then we find out for, for some particular sort of peculiarity you don't qualify. So we'd rather be in a position where we could say yes you know, sign off the application and you get your check, as opposed to saying no, yep. I'm afraid, you know, it's a no. Great. Um, I, I think you'll agree, it is a very, very innovative and generous scheme. Um, it's, some people say it's too good to be true. It's a brilliant scheme and it's going to really, uh, I think, 
um, give confidence uh, to people uh, to actually produce um, different kinds of games uh, and to get that access to finance that we've long needed uh, from other sources. So thank you very much to my panel. Um, please just don't hesitate to contact us uh, or I'm sure the speakers will be hanging around if you need to ask some questions. There's some guides. I'm sorry this was like a whirlwind uh, version um, and I'm talking double time, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>